I want to welcome everyone to NACA's COVID-19 CNA webinar. I'm Lori Porter and I'm live here in CNA TV studios. I serve as the CEO of the National Association of CNAs and as such, the team at NACA are always dedicated to ensuring our members and other CNAs have access to trusted and direct information and education on COVID-19 vaccine. I'd like to thank ShiftMed, the number one jobs app for CNAs for sponsoring this event. And I'd like to welcome the many ShiftMed healthcare professionals who are on the call today. We look forward to a robust partnership with ShiftMed in the future. We want to encourage all our guests today to voice your thoughts on COVID-19 vaccine, as well as any concerns you would like addressed today by our esteemed panel. Please use the chat feature. You can find that at the bottom of your screen to post your questions. We are especially honored to have AMDA, the Society of Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine as a great partner in this education. These doctors have worked tirelessly with NACA over the past month to ensure all of your valid questions and concerns are heard and that this education is developed and tailored to deliver you trusted answers. Today, we're very fortunate to have four physicians who are certified medical directors in long-term care. In addition, their passion about you and your resident's health and safety. With us today is Dr. Leslie Eber, Dr. Tim Hollihan, Dr. Swati Gar, and Dr. Inwa Dimwadi. At this time, we're going to get right into the PowerPoint and right into the education. So I would like to welcome Dr. Leslie Eber, who is going to kick us off. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I wanted to just thank you all for inviting um, us and, for, and me. Uh, it's an incredible honor to be here. Uh, I can't think of uh, a more profound audience that I would like to partner with. And so thank you very much. It's such an honor. I wonder if we can bring up the slide set and then we'll start the education. So. First, I wanted to thank you all for coming and participating in this COVID-19 vaccine education webinar. I think it's so important that we talk about the COVID-19 vaccine, share facts and share concerns and really be able to answer questions in real time. Next slide, please. So why should we get vaccinated? And I think that this is a really important uh, point you know, this is what we've been waiting for. This is the way to end the pandemic. This is the way that um, I saved my life and everyone around me that I care about, my family, my residents, my coworkers. It's a way to keep my residents safe and it's a way to help my community and be a leader in my community to stop the spread of the COVID-19 uh, virus. It's also an ability to set an example and there are little things that I'm looking forward to getting back. So it's a way that eventually we're gonna be able to take off our masks and go into a coffee shop with friends and sit down without masks and have a cup of coffee. I never thought in a million years that I would be dreaming of that moment. Next slide, please. But this is a pandemic and there are some honest and true concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine. And I think that that's valid. And so the questions that you have and the concerns that you have, you deserve honest, transparent and respectful answers. And so I've been doing um, COVID-19 vaccine education for actually four or five months now. And these are the top eight questions that I found that people are most curious about. So I thought what we'd do today is answer these questions and then field questions from you. And I think it's important that you get an opportunity to ask questions, get thoughtful answers, and make sure you have all the information you need to make your individual decision. Next slide, please. So the most common question that I get is, are the, is the COVID-19 vaccines, are they safe? 
And safety is the most important priority for the FDA and for vaccines in general. Unlike a medication, which is treating a disease and we have to weigh out, gosh, the risks and benefits of the medication versus the harm of the disease, we give vaccines to mostly perfectly healthy people. And so that means that the standard for safety is even elevated. We know that most side effects occur for any vaccine within six weeks of getting the shot in your arm. And we've learned that over decades. And so some of the recent vaccines that have been studied include the meningitis vaccine, the human papillona vaccine, the shingles vaccine. And so with all of that experience, we really have found that it's really not after six weeks that we see important side effects. And so the FDA though was concerned about ensuring to the public that the COVID-19 vaccine was indeed safe. So they elevated the bar and they have asked for eight weeks of safety data to monitor the COVID-19 vaccine. And that's above the six weeks that we would normally ask for. Monitoring of safety will continue with the vaccine every day now. But the FDA also advises that a minimum of 3,000 participants in a, COVID, in a vaccine trial be necessary to evaluate safety. And so that's their standard. But we know luckily with the Pfizer vaccine, there were 44,000 people that participated. And with the Moderna vaccine, there were 30,000 people. And future and current trials have even bigger amounts of participants. So even today, even looking at just the Pfizer vaccine, we needed 3,000 to evaluate safety and we have 44,000. So we have so much data for safety, more than we usually have. Next slide, please. And how effective is the COVID-19 vaccine? If I'm going to go through the trouble of getting it, will it work? And so um, these are really profound numbers. For the Pfizer vaccine, it's 95% protective for um, getting COVID-19 disease. And for Moderna, 94.1% protective. Very few vaccines reach this level of effectiveness, really just measles and the new shingles vaccine. But our flu vaccines aren't nearly as protective. So this is a really good vaccine. And the effectiveness wasn't any different with race or ethnicity or even age. Next slide, please. And it's important to kind of make sure that we're all represented in these trials. So I feel very grateful that um, over 40,000 people uh, were willing to be a part of the Pfizer trial and they were racially diverse just like us. So in the Pfizer trial, a total of 30% were racially diverse, 10% black people, 13% Hispanic people. And that's good to know because we want these trials to look like us as a nation. In Moderna, there were 37% racially diverse with 10% black and 20% Hispanic and Latino. And that also makes us feel that we were represented within these trials. And I'm very grateful to the people who participated in this trials because they were really first to get the vaccine and now we're second. Next slide, please. And then the next question I often get is, why should, should we trust the COVID-19 vaccine? And people are concerned about that. And I think it is important, and hold on, I just have to move one thing, okay to know that the FDA did use the same strict standards as they look at any vaccine, the human papilloma vaccine, the meningitis vaccine, and no steps were skipped. There's also an added benefit that there were two independent advisory committees also looking at this data. So unlike the emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine or convalescent plasma, we have three different groups looking at this data. And so one group called the Verbac advises the FDA. And then the other group called the ACIP advises the CDC. And these two groups are groups of independent scientists and virologists, and they are not part of the government. They are not part of the White House and they are not part of Pfizer or Moderna. They don't have any conflicts of interest and they're vetted for that. They aren't the nephew of somebody. 
and they have their own statisticians. They go through each um, of the data independently and they all come to independent decisions. And they actually, um, you can listen to these folks on YouTube and you can listen to what they have to say. So this leads to enormous amount of ability to have trust in the COVID-19 vaccine because it's not just one group that could be influenced. We have three separate groups and they're all independently looking at the vaccine and the data. Next slide, please. So what is an EUA, an emergency use authorization, and what does that mean to all of us? So an emergency use authorization is used for a vaccine during a public health crisis, which is certainly what we're in right now. And it's a shorter process, but no steps are skipped and no standards are lowered. The FDA assesses the known and potential benefits and if they outweigh the known and potential risks. Of course, we have these two separate advisory boards that participate in this emergency use authorization, but an EUA does not imply that the authorization was done too quickly or that the vaccine is not safe. Next slide, please. And so how was it this vaccine and these vaccines were developed so quickly? And I think that's a really good question. So the major reasons are because we had a global effort Everybody stopped what they were doing, a lot of different scientists who were working on other things, and they worked on this COVID-19 vaccines. We had nearly unlimited resources, money, knowledge, manpower, technology, um, production, investment. We even started making many of these vaccines knowing that we may have to throw them away if they didn't work, but we didn't want the anybody in society to have to wait an additional eight or nine months so that we would have to start making the vaccine once it was approved. So we did some steps at the same time and we you know, put our money where our mouth was to make sure that we could have this vaccine responsibly, thoughtfully, but as quickly as we could, making sure that safety was the number one priority. And then we had a large pool of diverse adults volunteer at the trial level um, and we're certainly grateful for that. Next slide, please. So what about how these vaccines work? And it's kind of a new technology and I know folks have a lot of questions about it and I think that that's fair. They're both messenger RNA vaccines, both the Pfizer and the Moderna. Um, they are messenger va vaccines, messenger RNA gives us an instruction to build a protein, but they can't build a virus. They also can't interact with our DNA. Um, they don't have access to our DNA, which is held in the nucleus. And so messenger RNA uh, makes um, a instructions for the protein. And then the protein gets released from our cells and then we make antibodies to that spike protein. Now messenger RNA doesn't last very long in our body which is why we have to store it at negative 70 degrees. The reason that is, is it doesn't last very long. When we get the shot in our arm, the messenger RNA can go into our cells but not our nucleus it can't make a virus and it can't interact with DNA. It makes these proteins and then it gets destroyed and it's gone um, because we certainly aren't that cold as negative 70 degrees. Next slide, please. And this is a little bit more about the messenger RNA. This is a lot of things that I've already mentioned. Um, it makes a protein and our bodies recognize that protein shouldn't be there. It makes antibodies to that protein. And therefore, if we were to see the COVID-19 virus for real, we would have our protection all ready to go. Next slide, please. So when and how long will I be protected by the COVID-19 vaccine? And I think that this is a moment where I like to mention that it's important that we're honest about what we know about the vaccine and what we don't know about the vaccine. And so we know that these vaccines are two doses, three to four weeks apart. So for the Pfizer, it's 21 days apart and for Moderna, 28 days apart. And protection only happens after that second dose about one to two weeks. So I always like to remind people that the day you get your first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, you have no more protection than the day before. And so 
you really have to be very careful and do all the things that we've been doing all along, wearing a mask and doing social distancing and protecting yourself from being exposed to the COVID-19 vaccine, even after that first dose. We need to wait till after the second dose, one to two weeks, until we're truly protected. How long does this um, vaccine protect us? We're not sure, we don't know. Every week and every month we go, we find a little bit more knowledge. There was a study just published that looked at about four months after the second dose, and it looks like that the vaccine continues to protect people. So I hope it lasts for a year, but we will learn about that. Um, this may be a vaccine just like the flu shot that we have to get yearly, and more information from that is coming. Next slide, please. Will I still need to wear a mask? <laughs> when can I take that mask off? I am right with you and hopeful that I can do that soon. But we really have to be very thoughtful about how, when we can do that. So we know again that the first dose does not fully protect us against the COVID-19 virus. So after our first dose, we will continue to need to wear our mask and do social distancing. And then we'll get our second dose 21 days later. And after that, we still need to wear a mask. But some people ask me, well, so right after two weeks after my second dose, surely I will be able to take off my mask then. Um, but we will still need to wear it for a while. We'll need to have herd immunity because even though we're protective and we're just a sliver a part of the um, United States of America population, it's possible that we could get without, of our, without our mask, some COVID-19 virus in our nose and we could share it with our grandmother or our mom and they could get incredibly sick. So we're gonna have to wait till herd immunity and then we will be one of the first people to take off our masks. Um, so it's really important to continue to do that safety um, and wear your mask. I always like to remind people that for the first time in the United States of America, people who work in nursing homes are number one. We're the priority and that's the way it should be. We have put our lives on the line and cared for patients. Even when there wasn't enough PPE, we went into work and cared for people and now we're saved first. And that's right. Next slide, please. So what should I expect when I get the vaccine? And there have been a lot of questions of that even more in the last couple of weeks. Um, the vaccine of course cannot give you COVID-19, but many people may have some short-term discomfort, fatigue, headache, muscle pain, chills and fever, pain where you got the shot. And that's really common. And I always think about this just like when I get the flu shot. So when I get the flu shot every year, I'm one of those people who do does feel tired. I feel a little achy. And I always think to myself, my body is amazing. My body is doing exactly what I need it to do. It's making antibodies. It's making protection so I don't actually get sick with the flu. And here is the same. If you have these side effects, and they're fairly common after the COVID-19 vaccine, you can think to yourself, my body's amazing, and I'm going to be one of those people who are protected. Now, if you don't get a side effect, your body is still 95% of the time making those antibodies. And so you don't have to worry if you don't get a short term discomfort. But if you do, it's not a bad sign. These reactions last for about 24 to 48 hours and are typically more pronounced after the second dose of the, of the COVID-19 vaccine. And these side effects are normal and expected. Next slide, please. So this is just kind of a, a graph to show some of these side effects. And this graph shows fever, fatigue, headache, chills, and muscle pain. And as you can see, day one, there's a little bit, day two is kind of the peak. And then by day three, everything is kind of going down. And that's what we can expect. And the top of the top graphic is for 16 to 55 year olds. And then the bottom is if you're older than 55. And you notice if you're older than 55, you actually have less side effects. And that's good to know. Next slide, please. And so more about what I should expect when I get the vaccine. 
it's really important that you get that second dose. And that second dose has to be the same vaccine that you got the first time. So these vaccines are not interchangeable. The, um, they are gonna be talking about the Moderna vaccine actually tomorrow, and I hope it gets approved as well, but you can't have the Moderna vaccine for the first dose and then get the Pfizer vaccine for the second dose. That doesn't really work as well. So if you want to get to that 95% effectiveness, you definitely have to get that second dose. Next slide, please. And what about some special circumstances? And we've gotten even more guidance from the CDC about this, which I'm, I'm really grateful for. So is it safe to get the COVID-19 vaccine if you've had COVID-19 infection in the past? And it is. So not only is it safe to get the COVID-19 vaccine, but it might be incredibly helpful. So because we have those two doses spread apart, we believe that getting vaccinated um, gives you even more protection and better protection and longer protection than it would be with a natural infection. So if you just got the COVID-19 virus infection. And so even if you've had the infection in the past, we are recommending that you get the vaccine still. And then I always get uh, questions about whether, you know, people had those antibody tests. So you could go and get your finger prick and they said, oh, you have antibodies, COVID-19, you're great. Um, and should we get uh, for the COVID-19 vaccine for those folks? So those tests are not always reliable. It's about a 50-50 chance that they were telling you the truth. And so even if you've had a test that shows that you have positive antibodies to COVID-19, please go and get the COVID-19 vaccine. And next slide, please. And now I'm going to pass the baton along to Dr. Tim Houlihan and have him take over and do the rest of the presentation. All right, and thank you, uh, Dr. Eber. That was a fantastic uh, review, and I, I uh, really enjoyed that and a lot of the points you made. Uh, and just to start out, it, it is uh, it is an honor uh, for all of us from AMDA to be here today, and I just want to echo that. Uh, you know, this is truly a great audience, and I feel that I just want to say start it by thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to our frontline staff. Uh, you know, being a part of an early outbreak in the spring, um, one of the promises I made uh, to to my staff there out in uh, Western New York, where the snow has started to fall, uh, you know who you are. That I would um, I would educate and I would try and work the hardest I could to uh, educate about COVID in general, advocate for staff and residents and. Uh, this is partly why we're all here today um, to learn from each other. Uh, so I just wanted to say a couple of things, and then you know we'll we'll definitely open up to to Q and A soon. Uh, and just you know a little bit about me, I'm the vice chair of the AMDA Ethics Committee. So I want to say a couple of things about the ethics of this and bring up a couple of points, uh, but also talk a little bit first about you know where should I look to get accurate information. Uh, it is. There's a lot of stuff out there these days, and and some of it is is reliable, and some of it isn't. You know, social media can be a good tool. Uh, it can be a good tool to spread, you know, appropriate information, but can also, you know, spread misinformation and and opinions um, based on that information. So be just be careful with that. Um, here are some links that I think are very reliable. Um, the CDC uh, shows a lot uh, of great links here that you can use. Uh, you know, AMDA itself and, and uh, uh, NACA also, uh, you know, is really our job is to ensure that the information being shared is true and real. Uh, there's just be careful with that and keep that in mind, uh, you know, when you're when you're going to look for information. And I encourage everyone to do that. It, it is important to do that. Um, but then also remember to talk to the people at your facilities, your medical directors, uh, your administrators, your directors of nursing, uh, and, and talk to the team about it and ask all the questions too to ensure that you fully understand uh, you know, the information you're getting and, and uh, what's true and what's not. So that's just a couple words on that. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that everyone has to do their part and get vaccinated to get back to a normal life. Dr. Eber, uh, you know, mentioned this already, and I, but I think it's a very, very important thing. You know, our one of the things that I've heard from staff already is, you know, it's scary 
to a degree to be first. And I, and I recognize that. But the reasons why we are first is because we are being prioritized. Us in post-acute care have dealt with such horrible things through this pandemic. It's, it's wreaked havoc on uh, not only us as staff, but our, the residents we have cared for, some for many years. And it's been an extremely difficult uh, thing to go through. And this to me is, is in a way, um, our, all of our hard work paying off. This is you know, us being prioritized to get something that, that will really, so at some point in the near future here, end this, I believe. So you know, this really is integral and important for us to, uh, to do, um, not only for ourselves, our residents, but also our families. Uh, just a couple words about the ethics of this. You know, the ACIP, the, advan the advisory committee that's been uh, helping to, that's been formed to advise the FDA has, has four ethical principles that I think are extremely important. Maximize benefits and minimize harms, right? So that's extremely important. We always wanna make sure there's benefit and, and not harm and we're doing the right things that, you know, for us and our patients. Promote justice, right? Commitment to remove unfair and unjust and avoidable barriers to vaccination. So we all get it uh, in a fair and just way. And I think that's extremely important. Um, mitigate health inequalities. Ensure every person has opportunity to get his or her full health potential and no one is disadvantaged. And I saw this, you know, I saw it come up in the chat, uh, full disclosure, I got mine this morning. Uh, and it was quite an experience, you know, it was me, uh, you know, there going in with a lot of other staff members, there was there was, uh, uh, there was CNAs, there was uh, environmental staff, there were nurses, there were physicians, there was people of all races, and, and all, uh, all, all backgrounds. And it really was great to see. And it's good to see that. Uh, and promote transparency. It's essential to building and maintaining public um, trust during this vaccine planning and rollout. And we have to be transparent about this and ask the appropriate questions. And there's, uh, yeah, as uh, being brought up on the screen, there's some pictures of me getting it this morning and it really was an empowering experience. And, and uh, you know, it was just after the eight to nine months that we've been through, uh, it was a beacon of hope. And, and I hope that people can see it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, uh, and don't worry for those of you who are jealous, it's coming. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, hopefully in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, for all of you, no matter what part of the country you're in, uh, that you'll be seeing this. And it was a very exciting experience. And um, I really uh, think it was great. So how do I feel? Uh, I feel I feel great, actually. Um, maybe a little bit tired, um, but that could just be from, you know, the pandemic in general and all the hard work we're doing. But overall, so far, uh, I feel great. I feel fine. I think I look the same as I did this morning, which is reassuring. So, <laughs> so, so far, so good. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that because I definitely want to make sure there's a lot of time uh, uh, for questions. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, so I will mm. uh, turn it over to, I think, Lori next or whoever else. And, and then we're happy to field uh, questions from the group. So thanks. thanks Absolutely. Everyone. Thank you so much, Tim and Leslie and the rest of the group for your work on putting this webinar and education together. I know everyone has worked tirelessly on it and I thank you. 2020 has been an unprecedented year in so many ways, especially in long-term care. I've never been as proud or as heartbroken of what I've, been, what I've seen in nursing homes over the last 10 months. We've seen so many people leave this world before their time. We've seen teams band together with such little resources and staff they have had and fight this virus since the earliest days of this pandemic. I know many of you are scared. You have every right to be scared. I'm scared too. COVID-19 has ended the lives of over 300,000 people in the United States and over 1.6 million worldwide. The largest loss of life has been in long-term care, but I don't need to tell you all that. You're living it every single day. This virus isn't going anywhere anytime soon. I'm not going to get up here and tell you that you have got to take the shot, get the vaccine. That is a choice you will have to make yourself. Many of you saw that I posted on Facebook that I will get the shot 
the vaccine as soon as I qualify to get it. That's my declaration. It isn't meant to influence your choice. What I do hope that you will do is listen to the information being provided on this webinar and ask questions. We are CNAs. We are strong. And taking care of our residents is our number one priority. And NACA's number one priority is taking care of you. It's time now to turn to our question and answer period. And I'd like to introduce those CNAs from the board of directors of NACA, my bosses. They have graciously agreed to join this webinar as panelists to ask some docs the questions up front and personal and to represent CNAs across this nation. So I'd like to first start off by introducing Celeste, excuse me, Celeste Wooten. Celeste is from Virginia. Karen Grantfinitz is from Missouri. Tammy McElnay is from the state of Oregon. I'm not sure that our board chair, Lisa uh, Shepard, was able to join us. And so, uh, yes, I believe, she, yes, she's on. Lisa Shepard is our board chair, and she is a CNA from the state of Iowa. All of these CNA board members of NACA are career CNAs who have been in this profession and on the front lines long before the pandemic, and they have committed themselves to being CNAs long after the pandemic. So let's first start with Sheena Bumpus and see if she has some questions for our esteemed panel of physicians. Sheena? Did I, I don't think I introduced Sheena, I'm sorry. Here's Sheena Bumpus from Oklahoma. Uh, there's only so many squares on the, on the screen here. Sorry, Sheena, didn't mean to leave you off at all. It's okay. Take it away. One of the questions, I know you did say that we cannot get COVID from the shot. Um, you mentioned that a lot of adults were in the trials. Um, if we took the shot and with the herd immunity, what about our children? Has any children taken the shot? Or should we get our children vaccinated? Okay, I'll just let the doctors field those as they feel. They can interrupt each other to get to you, Sheena. I see uh, Swati has her uh, uh, self unmuted. So Swati, you wanna respond to Sheena? Sure. Um, yeah, so one of the things that you asked is, um, can, can we get COVID? Uh, we cannot. And that's because it's neither a live virus nor a dead virus. It's a synthetic mRNA technology that has actually been used before, not in vaccination, but in cancer treatment. And that's why we are seeing a lot of cancer treatment that is not only effective, but also is low in um, side effects now that we are seeing. So they took that technology from the cancer treatment and they said, we're gonna use this technology. As far as um, kids are concerned, uh, so the second question that you asked is about herd immunity. And uh, Dr. Eber had talked about the herd immunity a little bit. Herd immunity, uh, approximately about 70 to 80% people in, the, in, in a community, in a country need to be immunized in order to have that herd immunity. So basically that's the numbers that we are looking at. So until then, mask, it is, it is a great question. Um, as far as children are concerned, uh, there are trials actually, um, I was listening to NPR the other day. People are, uh, there are trials that are actually starting to enroll kids. Um, you know, it's a harder group to enroll. Uh, so they do trials in adults and make sure that they are very comfortable with the safety and efficacy. And that's the other reason we know that they are now starting to enroll the kids because they are pretty comfortable with the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. And that's why they are trying to, uh, they are basically saying, we feel comfortable uh, with the side effects, let's enroll the kids. Um, Dr. Demiati, do you have any uh, other information on the pediatric use? Uh, 
I don't see Dr. Eber. Any... Uh, I'm on mute. Uh, the, the vaccine has not been studied be below the age of 16. So right now we don't have any data in children. There are going to be studies uh, done in the between 12 to 16 year old. Thank you. By the way, I, there's a lot of question in the Q&A and I'm trying to, uh, I was busy answering them. <laughs> sure, sure. We're gonna have uh, our uh, behind the scenes folks uh, represent the chat questions if we miss any pertinent questions. So I appreciate you all taking, paying attention to the chat as we go along as well. Tammy, how about you from Oregon? How about, do you have a question for the doctors? Uh, we can't hear you, Tammy. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So speaking of the children then, is it safe to take it while you're pregnant? Let's unmute Tim. He was shaking his head. Or Tim, can you? I was actually just going to refer to to Swati or, or Rimwa okay. there for that. Yep. You guys can. Uh, I can. I can take that question. Um, you know, they they were not uh, pregnant women were not purposely included in the study. Mm. However, there are some people by chance who got pregnant during the you know the vaccine uh, study. Um, results from uh, them so far shows that there is no untoward effect, but we have to, you know, follow them because they're still pregnant. No one has delivered, uh, but there was, uh, they do not think based on how, what the vaccine is, they do not think there's going to be any um, risk uh, for the fetus. And you really have to, to look at it is what's your risk of getting COVID? Uh, if you are in a place where there is a lot of COVID infection, uh, your risk while you're pregnant of, you know, getting more severe disease is high. So you have to kind of balance your risk and the kind of unknown, you know, kind of, we don't know that if there is side effect, but the, but the experts saying it's probably going to be safe knowing from how the vaccine is made and what we have learned with other, you know, vaccines in general. So uh, okay. It's a discussion that you should probably have with your physician uh, and balance kind of what's your risk, what's your benefit. If I was pregnant, by the way, I would take it. I'm just kind of waiting impatiently to be on the list to take it uh, because that's the only way we can go back to normal life. So I, right. you know, there's no way if not all of us get it, we're never going to be go back to normal. So I, I, I want to kind of urge everyone, this is like the best vaccine that we have had was 95% effectiveness. So I would, you know, I would really would like everyone to get vaccinated. It has been shown to be very safe. Um, what we know though, that it probably will cause you to have some pain at the injection site. You know, most of you got the tetanus shot and you know how you kind of, your arm is achy for two or three days. This is similar. Uh, I don't know if anyone of you are old enough I am older and I received the shingle vaccine and I was not feeling well the day after uh, during the first dose and the second dose, but it was transient a day later, I was fine. And it's, this is probably going to be very similar um, that what we have experienced with other vaccine. Um, otherwise, you know, so far we haven't seen anything kind of majorly concerning uh, I don't know if you want to keep me talking or maybe have other people address the anaphylaxis. Yeah, what, one thing I did want to address, uh, because it came up, I think, uh, Leslie, you had mentioned the fact that a lot of us feel like a lot of us in nursing home are so unused to being in spotlight and people actually saying, hey, take this first because it has never happened in their lifetime, right? I just wanted to give you a little background. So I'm the chair of the infection advisory committee with AMDA. And I can tell you that there is a lot of background work that has gone on where we have sat down with health and human services. We have sat down with CDC and we have told them over and over, this is your priority area. So the reason why you are and we are getting offered the vaccine is not because, hey, here is a group that we never thought of before we're going to give them vaccine, but because we are having a lot of advocacy effort behind the scenes, going to them and saying, 
hey guys, come on. You know, we have had, like Lori said, we have had the highest mortality. Our CNAs are the number one people who are turning those patients, who are cleaning those patients, who are doing everything with those patients. We, our CNAs need it. And the last point I wanna, one more point I wanna make. Among the people who are eager to take the vaccine, I mean, you go on Twitter and you look at the doctor's tweets, they are running to get the vaccine, okay? Among all the healthcare providers, the doctors are running. They're like, we'll stand in front of everyone. Why do you think that is happening? Because they have seen that, like literally seen the data. They're like, we want it. And we want our CNAs in our long-term care facilities to take advantage and have the same advantage as you know all the other doctors are having. So that's why we did that advocacy. And that's the result of why you're seeing this come to long-term care. I just wanted to make sure that we, you have that background. Excellent point. Excellent point, Swati. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Matt, I, I assume you can hear me. Um, do we have a question from the chat that we need to represent at this point? Yeah, Amen. yes. Okay. Uh, one, one moment here. I'm sorry. I no, you're fine. Hard. I just knew I saw a bunch come in, so I don't want to. One of the big questions that I have seen come up, not only in the registrations, but in the chat here today is, um, I, if I have cancer, should I take the vaccine? Well, they're all shaking our head. I think anyone who has a risk of getting severe COVID should run and get the vaccine. Uh, to prevent you from getting COVID. This is a very good vaccine. Uh, so anyone with diabetes, anyone with hypertension, anyone with cancer, you should go get the vaccine. Uh, the, the study also included people with uh, HIV under control as well. Uh, we don't know in people who are immunocompromised, maybe on chemo or other agent that are immunosuppressive, if they respond as well as you know normal people, but I was, it's still recommended. Um, that that those patients or those people get vaccinated. Okay. Yeah, I got a question on allergies. I think we're getting a lot of questions on allergies. If you have food allergies, that is not a contraindication. Uh, it's basically, if you go there, you have food allergies, they're gonna give you the vaccine, they're gonna watch you more than 15 minutes, You know, probably 30 minutes. If you have allergies to Miralax, that is, you know, that is the polyethylene glycol component of it. Then you need to let them know that I have allergy to Miralax or polyethylene glycol. I, I, I think everyone on this panel knows Miralax, right? <laughs> I so don't maybe know. it's what he... <laughs> but I just did. So, <laughs> so even if you have you know, the, there is, you know, any allergy to, to food and, and allergen in the, in, in the air and everything is not important. If you had allergy to other vaccines where you were going very sick and hospitalized or an infusion very sick or hospitalized, it's still a precaution, you could still get it. So the only reason you won't get it if you're allergic to the component of the vaccine, which is what uh, is ethylene glycol. So most of us are able to get it. Um, if you have an anaphylaxis to a vaccine and you use EpiPen, that's, you know, there is a discussion and you need to be observed more. So I, I, you know, I think people should feel comfortable receiving the vaccine. Thank you guys for that. And another question that came in from uh, the chat, um, or not, not the chat, but the registration questions was around, um, you know, we know that there's the two different vaccines that are being discussed right now, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, but are all people, regardless of race, religion, socioeconomic factors, is everybody getting the same vaccine or are there different vaccines out there other than just the two? That's a, so that's a great question. Uh, Question, Matt. This is Tim. I'll take it. Uh, so, just out of so the the answer, a hundred percent is yes. Everyone is getting the the same vaccine. Uh, you know, and in I can say that as I kind of mentioned in my uh, my talk a little earlier, 
uh, from experience now, you know, what I saw, um, you know, the same allotment, the same vaccine that came into the hospital was given, uh, you know, to myself, my colleagues of, of every race um, background. Um, so I saw that firsthand today. So 100% yes. And it's a good question. I mean, based on things that have happened in history in the past, I think it's important to ask, to ask these questions. Um, so yes, the answer to that is, is that everyone will be getting uh, the, same, uh, the same vaccine, yes. And I'm gonna piggyback on that one because here is what I would say, regardless of whether it is Pfizer or Moderna, those two vaccines, like Leslie mentioned, they are actually in cold storage, in very cold storage. Most nursing homes don't have the setup. So my concern is if I, we have to make up our mind early because if I say, nah, I don't want to take it today, your vaccine may be given to somebody else because they can't store it in the nursing home. It's not like a flu shot that they can store it in the nursing home. So it may just, you know, you may not have access to that the second time around for several days before it makes it back if it does. So, you know, we have to keep that in mind. And that's why I'm telling my CNAs and my staff is, let's know all about it and make up our mind so that when that truck comes, we are, if we wanna say yes, we say yes. If we wanna say no, we say no. But when we say maybe later, um, you know, vaccines are limited right now and they're giving it to the priority groups, it may go to somebody else who's willing and ready at that point. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, thank you. Corinne, are you ready with a question? Corinne? Yes, I am. Get close to your mic, so please. After you get, so after you get the vaccination, will you still need to be tested regularly Yes. Did you <laughs> like, hear? Yes, I did hear your question. So basically your question is, do I still need to be tested af after I get the vaccination? The answer to that is yes. yes. And that that is because of what Leslie said, right? Unless we have herd immunity, uh, we are still susceptible. And, you know, after that second dose, you get better. It gets better and better, but it doesn't stop till we get that herd immunity. So right now we do need to get tested. That's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Shepard, do you have a question for, the, for our doctors today? Um, yes, I do. Um, how was the vaccine created so quickly and still be safe? I can answer this one. Uh, okay. You know, everyone, everyone jumped on this. You know, what was it called? Um, um, warp speed. Warp speed. And because there was a lot of money, a lot of people communicating but there was also ongoing research uh, internationally and in the U.S. to create new vaccine, like influenza vaccine. There's research to try to create a vaccine that will be used once and not every year. Uh, so the studies have, you know, there was a lot of research being done to create new vaccine for different diseases. And so we had the knowledge, we had the money, we have the cooperation, and we have to push to create, you know, to find a vaccine very quickly. And so that's why the reason it was, it was developed very quickly. You know, by January, February, the vaccine company were already working on it um, because of the urgency of this pandemic. Um, it's something that has been studied for years and this was the right opportunity to see if it works. And the studies that were done were done very quickly. They recruited more people than what is needed to get the FDA approval. And we are, you know, jumping in joy that they have been found to be effective. Um, you know, there is plenty of studies, you know, where nothing was found to be, you know, effective. We are very lucky that so many people work together to find, you know, you know, at least two vaccines. We have more that would be approved approved in the near future. And not all the vaccine are made the same way. And so uh, we're talking today about the two that one that is approved, one is going to be approved soon, uh, which use this synthetic messaging RNA, but there is other vaccine. None of them, by the way, have the full virus in it and none of them will cause 
of COVID. And so we're learning more as more, um, more studies are completed and data is reviewed. Can I just chime in as well? Um, we're, you know, we're very lucky, but these two vaccines are incredibly effective. I hope that the future vaccines are as effective, but we really don't know that. And so um, something to think about, if you pass on this vaccine, you may be offered another vaccine, but that vaccine may be 60% effective or 70% effective. So it's very lovely to start off with two vaccines that are so effective that you know you're going to be protected. And I think you have to kind of weigh that out in your personal decision about waiting versus getting this vaccine. I have a question that I don't know if anybody posed or not, but um, I guess my my question would be as as it pertains to the vaccination why are there other supposed healthcare professionals that are putting out misinformation is there any way a person can choose i mean can know whether this person knows what they're talking about because we've seen posts from Pfizer employees current employees that say they heard it makes you sterile so yeah it's a i i'll start on that um it's a it's an extremely good question and it's and it's a question of how you know on social media when you go on there how do we know what's negative what's true you know what's not it's, it's, it's very difficult these days i think the most important thing to do is go to some of the trusted sources and links that we shared earlier and then also when you see something there um like for instance you mentioned Will this change my DNA? No, it will absolutely not. It's not how it works. Um, you know, will this cause me to be sterile? You know, absolutely not. None of the data has shown any of that. And you have to be careful about people just talking about their opinions versus what's real. So, you know, when you see something like that, I would encourage not to just engage in this ongoing uh, discussion with it, engage, ask the real question, go to a doctor, go to your, go to a trusted source that you know and whether it's uh, an organization like NACA or AMDA or the CDC or someone at your facility and say, is this true? Well, you know, no, it is not. You know, just be very clear in those questions and have the discussions. Yeah. Well, here in the Midwest, uh, and we're in the mid Midwest, and it is very confusing to us because believe it or not, as uh, late as May, I was hospitalized and no doctors were wearing masks. So we don't know who to trust out here in middle America when people are opinionated and uh, we don't know who knows what they're talking about and who don't. So I thank you for Tim for referring everyone back to us and AMDA and the trusted links that are out there because sometimes even my own doctors don't know what's best. Apparently the, my in-laws went a couple of weeks ago and the doctor who came in said, well, I'll put a mask on if you want me to. That's unfortunate. And, and I, and I, is, but I respect that. I respect that. Yeah. yeah awesome. So. Well, just, uh, we're trying to do the best we can between our two organizations to bring the most trusted information we could find and research ourselves. So thank you all. Uh, let's see, how about we go to Celeste Wooten in Virginia. Celeste. Hello. Hello. So I kind of have a two part question. One piggybacks on a question that Matt asked, but my first question is, if staff receive the vaccination and they happen to become symptomatic the next day, will they be able to go to work? Yeah, I can take that. That's a very, very good question because, you know, CDC just came out with what to do. So one thing that I want to make clear is when you get the vaccine, you're going to have the post-vaccine effects and those vaccine post-vaccine effects are not post are not covid symptoms right. they are post co, post vaccine symptoms what are post vaccine symptoms we've all got gotten flu shot we've got our tetanus shot mm -hmm. we've gotten if if i have not dr demiati i have not gotten my shingles shot but i they tell me <laughs> it hurt it hurts <laughs> that, that it hurts so yes, so if you have like body aches, joint, joint pain, you don't wanna get out of bed, those are post vaccine effects. On the other hand, if you had, so 
probably you're not going to feel good. Get it when you're going to be off the next couple days. That mm -hmm. would be a good idea because you won't want to get out of bed. I mean, we'll ask Tim tomorrow how he feels. But, <laughs> but you know, hopefully he is going to be off or whatever, or he's going to take a towel and show up to work. But, um, you know, so, so those are one effects, right? So those are post-vaccine effects. If you do have to come to work, you should be allowed to come to work, okay? Now, if you have, on the other hand, because, you know, right now COVID is going on and in the middle of COVID pandemic, we are getting the vaccine. So we mm -hmm. need to make a difference between what I am having. If you start having a runny nose, a sore throat, cough, shortness of breath, can't smell anything, can't taste anything, that's mm -hmm. COVID, right? That's COVID. So don't think that that's because of the vaccine. That is because in the last 14 days, you were around somebody who gave you COVID, okay? If mm -hmm. you have that, you got to call into your DON or your building and say, I don't feel good. I have COVID symptoms and they are going to get you tested. And that test is typically a PCR test. Now, we talked about the COVID symptoms, which are totally different from the vaccine right. effects. One thing is a questionable, right? Fever. They said you may have some fever for the first two days after you get the vaccine, but you may also have fever if you had COVID, right? How do we deal with this? If you have fever, stay at home, quarantine from your family, just in case. Watch yourself for two days. It should go away in two days. If you still have fever in two days, you got to come back for, you know, you got to go for testing somewhere. So does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. The other part of my question, um, and I'm going to kind of age myself when I ask this question. Um, I'm running into a lot of us older CNAs, um, especially African-American CNAs who grew up hearing the stories of the Tuskegee. We do have a lot of mistrust with the healthcare system and African-Americans. I myself have decided I am going to take the vaccine. And what I'm hearing and running into when I am talking to other African-American CNAs is, I'm not gonna be the guinea pig. I'm not gonna be the test bunny, all the names that you can think of. How do we, the ones that have decided to take it, be an encouragement to the other CNAs who are on the fence? I won't, I won't lie and say I'm not scared. Because I, you know, because it, it is, everything is brand new, but I'm scared to bring it home to my family. I'm scared to bring it home to my diabetic husband. I'm scared to bring it home to my children. So I'm going to do what I need to do to protect everybody. But I want to know how we can encourage other CNAs to make their own decision, but to bring a trust factor in there as well. That's an excellent question. Um, and I think it's real. And I think if I had to pick one uh, you know, one of the top two or three questions that I get to that I've talked with my staff, mistrust is, is one of them. Uh, and I think you, how I, so I can tell you, I don't think there's one right answer for it, but how I've handled it to this point so far is one, this is partly why um, I wanted to be one of the first in line. So I could sit down with them and say that I put this into my body because I feel that it is safe and it is mm -hmm. right. Otherwise, I would never do that. Now, all of us haven't done that yet, right? <laughs> and we can't, you know, but when you do, I think it's important to, to uh, say that, to, to, to document that, whether it's a picture or whatever else like that, and say, and, and just say, I did this because I believe it is safe. I, I think that really, um, you know, at least from today, you know, going through one day of having gotten this morning, I, I talked to CNAs and it, it seems definitely seemed to make them feel feel comfortable with it. They're still scared. And I said, mm -hmm. it's okay to be scared. I'm scared, right? But I still feel that this is the best based on what I've read and all the data I've seen is the right thing medically. And why we're getting it first is not because we're guinea pigs. It's because, and I can say this, and we all can say this on this call, we have wanted us to be first. This is why we're we getting fought it for this. We yes. fought for this. <laughs> so that's, yes, that's my, I, I hope that gives you some ammunition to bring. And I, but it's a very good question. And I validate that question. It needs to be answered honestly. 
So, and yeah. I, I, um, I will um, piggyback on that. Here is why I'm a person of color. Okay, mm -hmm. so I just wanna, I just wanna let you know. One of the things that we know about people of color is COVID is going to disproportionately affect us. Right. Okay. And you said the same thing. I don't want to take it to my husband. I don't want to take it to my husband. I don't want to take it to my children. So I will get vaccinated. You know, that is, that is so important because I would rather get vaccinated than take COVID to me, to my children, because I am going to be disproportionately more affected. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is number one. Number two, when it comes to guinea pigs, it, you know, yes, that, that I, I totally get it. I totally get it. But also, as Leslie said, you know, there are 40,000 people right. in one and 30,000 people in other. And then there are more vaccines that are more, more and more. There's so many people in the trials. They have all taken it before us. And the good thing about this one, and I, I see exactly what you're saying. The good thing about this trial is one in 10 people were people, were black people. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, three in 10 people were people of color. That's United States, okay? Right. So, you know, that has, you know, this kind of people of color, uh, you know, inclusion of people of color, I don't see in very many trials. I was gonna say that. Right. It, that is rare. I agree, you know, I agree. It's, it's so amazing that I actually saw me represented in this current trial. It makes me feel better, you know? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Good we question. don't we we don't see that often. I think that's very important. But this study is different in that way, and I think it's very important to, to acknowledge that. That's right. Absolutely important. Uh, I have a, another per, uh, question from my own. I was talking with someone the other day, and and I know that hepatitis B is not not to be put in the same category in any way as COVID nineteen. But I was a nursing home administrator during the Hep B vaccinations, and I don't recall anybody being afraid. What's the difference? What's happened? We all lined up like little soldiers and took our Hep B two. Or, was it a three-step process? I think it was two or three anyway, and no one was scared. I mean, occasionally people say, "What's the side effects?" and that was about it. And so here we are in a nation that's got this hesitancy. I mean, Is it I, just, last go thing ahead, you want to take that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that it has to do with the speed in which it came to fruition. You know, we didn't have a vaccine in the beginning of 2020, and now we do. And I think that made people apprehensive. And I also think there was a lot of politi political, you know, pressure and speak about this. And that led to, I think, a you know, a different kind of mistrust. You know, when you have someone who is political, who is recommending a lot of different things that don't seem to be just right, um, you wonder about this vaccine. And so I think that I wish it, none of it had been politicized, but it was. And I think that that's leading to apprehension. Good. Yeah. I, Thank you so much for that, Leslie. I do want to acknowledge that it is 4.33, actually, p.m., um, and we have uh, come to the end here. But I do want to – we've gotten so many good questions from, from our attendees. And so um, first I want to thank everyone who attended uh, this webinar um, and asking any questions and getting educated. And I do want to let you all know that the recording will be available to this webinar. Um, and a link will be sent out to everybody who attended um, that has instructions on how to view this webinar um, and how to share it with others. It's completely free. But I, I, I do want to make a small imposition um, on our team of experts here. If they have any extra time, um, I would like to extend this Q&A session a little bit longer than our allotted time. And uh, if attendees can, can stick around, they are more than welcome to. But if you've got to go off and do other things, we thank you for your time. We'll go to a 15-minute overtime call or an overtime period. We'll do a, a hard close in, in 15 minutes from now if Matt will watch the clock. Yes, ma'am. And uh, I thank all of you that took the time this hour to be on with us. And we will now look at the chat questions and those that were not represented. And that's what we will be handling in these last 15 minutes. So, uh, 
and Rita Carrier, I want to say, has been very active on the chat. I see her name pop up a lot. And I caught a question that she asked on there earlier. Uh, cancer kills a lot more people, a lot of people every year. Why aren't we rushing to a cancer uh, cure or vaccine or something of that nature? So I promised our CNAs that it wouldn't matter the questions they asked that we would take them. So if one of you would like to speak Actually, to that. Actually, that's, that's beautiful. beautiful. I know, I love this. I love this because I get so excited. You know, I'm so excited about this vaccine because it's not your typical flu vaccine and this vaccine and that vaccine. Actually, she has such a good point. This technology has been used in cancer treatment to get better results and less side effects and literally has been pulled from those cancer treatments and the successes that they have seen to bring into, you know, vaccination. And like Dr. Demyati said, they were actually looking at using that technology to make a soup like cool, just rocking flu vaccine. And they were looking at it and they've been studying it and they are like, we're gonna make this happen. And then suddenly COVID happened. So all these people are like, well, we got COVID happening. We're gonna take that same technology that we were studying for flu and flip over here and work it for COVID. And that's why when you ask that, how, how did they so quickly get to this? You know, they were working for a long time and they were working on you know, other diseases and they said, well, we're gonna work on COVID and everyone flipped towards COVID and that's why the scientists were able to get to it so quickly. And the, the other part about that, remember about COVID-19 that is different than cancer, that's different than other things, is the societal impact across all areas of life it affects it is that that's partly the reason part, you know is, is what he was saying why the shift occurred it, 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 restaurants are going out of business people are you know because of everything we have to do and our lives have been shifted so much that is why there was been so much it was it was um the time frame the amount of money and and why it wasn't used in maybe it was shifted from cancer, like so I said, flu and other things. So just remember that it's important to think. So about. I can also repeat one more thing that Tim has said. The more we get people vaccinated, the more likely we'll get back to normal life. Um, you know, if only like half the population is vaccinated, we will not go back to normal life. So we really need as many people as possible vaccinated. So we could protect the one that are refu refusing to be vaccinated, but the more we have people vaccinated, the more we will be able to go out of our house without mask and not rush home and clean our hand and, you know, with <laughs> and take our clothes off and change. Uh, so please, everyone, um, it's a great opportunity that, you know, vaccine is coming to the long-term care uh, first, uh, the people in the hospital as well. Uh, the others in the community are really waiting eagerly for it, but it probably won't be till like June that, you know, the regular person with no risk factor will get it. But I urge you all, you know, to get vaccinated. Thank you we guys so much. For you guys to be first. So we I, are I first. Do, I, I do have <laughs> another question from chat here. Um, and well, it's from the registrations as well, because as you know, our, a lot of our, uh, attendees today were CNAs, our CNAs, and what is the number one concern in their mind? It's it's their residents. And so some of the questions that we've had haven't been around what will happen to me if I take the vaccine, rather what happens to my older, sicker residents who take the vaccine? Is it safe for them? Yes, and, and you know, again, back to people who were studied in this vaccine, this is one of the things that we have so much of angst and anger because we are all taking care of older people. And the studies typically that are done are done in young adults. This actually got studied in older people. Yay, finally, right? <laughs> you know. So yes, it has been studied in older people and it has been studied in quite a bit of older people, like 85 years of age. Um, and it's been found to be safe. In fact, if you look at the vaccine effects, like the effects that you're gonna have, like the pain and the malaise and you know your body aches, that's actually lower in older adults, you know, than uh, than in younger people. 
And remember, the, the mortality, as we all know, is extremely high in our residents. We've experienced this. So going along with, you know, their chance of experiencing side, experiencing side effects is less, you know, even if they had some of those mild side effects, you know, the, their chances of dying are so much higher of getting COVID than getting the vet, you know, having any issue with a vaccine. So it's not even, you know, have solace in that piece in that. So we still have a couple hundred people with us and I'd like to ask a selfish question of our guest. Uh, and I'm actually putting AMDA or the doctors with us today on the spot a little bit, but if you have enjoyed this type of education through NACA, I would imagine that the doctors would take some type of rotation with us to present some additional uh, Q&A type uh, in the future. And if you just take a second to write yes or no, whether you would like something like that or not, I certainly don't wanna call on them if there will be no audience for it, but if you'd like to see more of these types of education on COVID-19 and the vaccine, I'm certain they would love one at a time anyway to help us with a schedule of that. There's a lot. There's a lot of yeses on the. And, and <laughs> as doctors, we are all in. Hundred percent. <laughs> Absolutely, it's been such a pleasure, and it's really a dream for us to connect with people that we work with on a larger scale. We are so um, feel so lucky, feel so blessed that we are here. I would come back in a heartbeat. <laughs> I would too, and you know, I'll just give you a personal story. Today, um, I was telling everybody today, you know, how uh, my day was <laughs> this morning. Um, my DON called me and she said, we had six call outs. 20% of our nurses and our CNAs are out with COVID. You know, it breaks my heart. They are the ones, y'all are the ones who actually spend the most time with our patients. Y'all are the ones who give the care the most and the hardest care. And we want to make it available to you. And right. yeah. it's, 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 I can't, I can't begin to tell you how personally I feel about this as a medical director of my facility. You know, two seconds later, my DON called crying hysterically. She said, there is a surveyor in the building. Okay, this is what we are dealing with. Oh, I have a happy ending. That surveyor left with compliments and no tags. I kid you not. Okay, I kid you not. Meanwhile, I was actually in my other building, uh, got a chorus of you know mask wearing students doing chorale to get my CNAs and my nurses you know, feel festive. So they did it outside of the nursing home, but they sang for them. Literally, guys, you guys are taking care of these people, our patients, our residents, and you guys are doing the hardest job ever. And I wish to God that you would take the vaccine. And I would, if I don't hear one more time that one more CNA got sick. And this is why heroes get the vaccine first, not guinea pigs, heroes get the vaccine first. And we've been fighting for that. Thank you. For I, that. I think we have two minutes. Can I address some of the questions I saw uh, that do. are more kind of uh, egg allergy is not a contraindication like for flu vaccine. If you're allergic to egg, you can still get this vaccine. Uh, as we said, um, this, you know, you still need to be tested as per, you know, the federal CMS regulation, even if you are vaccinated. And the vaccine will not affect the test like the PCR test or the antigen test. It might affect the antibody test, uh, but they have to do a specific and a different antibody test uh, to differentiate between vaccine and infection. So don't worry about you know, becoming positive because you got the vaccine. Any of the rest of the docs want to take anything from the chat? I, I can't see it quite as well as you might be able to, so. There's a lot of questions. We did another hour. <laughs> yeah, we sure do. I, I, I do want to break in here on that uh, poll that I just put out. Would you find valuable future webinars like this? We had 107 people respond and 100% of them were yes. We didn't, we actually didn't have a single no. I so. just want to say AMDA and NACA, you won today. We are serving the front line. I knew CNAs needed their own direct education. 
and thank you guys so much for joining us to honor and recognize CNAs with this information and education. Uh, any other questions, Matt, you want to raise in the last minute? Uh, I, I don't think so. All I want to do is thank the, the, the docs so much for their yeah. time today. I've been working with them for the past I don't even, it, it's hard for me to measure time these days, but I, yeah. I think it's the past two or three weeks. Um, I've, I'm on various work groups and I got connected with, with these four and it has been absolutely amazing. I have rarely met many physicians who truly care and understand the front line as much as these four here on the screen. And Erin too, I know Erin hasn't oh, yes. been on screen here, but she is the lady behind the scenes who is pulling everything together and making it happen. So thank you so much, Erin. Erin, yeah, if you, you have Aaron. your makeup on, you can come on screen for a second. <laughs> if you don't, I just put you on the spot. I do not, so I will say thank you. That was a great, thank you all. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you, well, Lori and Naka. I'm just thrilled and uh, look forward to doing another one sometime soon. And thank awesome. you all for your questions. And thank you, you know, thank you all for giving us your story and asking your questions. And I hope all of you, this has helped you to you know, get convinced that it's a good idea to get the vaccine. And thank you, thank you all for everything that you do every day. Our yes. residents would be at a loss. We would not be able to get them the care. And it's all for each one of you. So thank you. Well, for our uh, final closing then, I want to thank you and all, and our sponsor ShiftMed, the presenters, and our CNA panel for taking the time off today and away from their residents to represent CNAs across America. And I thank you to those others who took the time to join us today. And certainly a massive thank you to all the heroes on the front line battling this dreadful and invisible enemy. Keep caring and keep sharing. Thank you all, we love you.